protectors and so you know what a classic uh, Christmas Eve. I was like, this is make my, my uh, make my life more happy than working 80, 90, 100 hours a week on, on this tree top restaurant. Uh, which was great, but but it was still it was like cooking with one of your hands on the back. It was this. You said the story about picking your own herbs in the forest that was just beside you. You went to the local uh, organic, if very good, biodynamic uh, farmer. Then you picked the herbs from there, like picked the vegetables from there. You made uh, beautiful stoneware. You got that from the band of Casabias, whatever. And, and then you you served uh, a natural wine or something like that. And then you soaked with the table and all of this. All of these uh, trends and deals that was up at the time, and um, it became just a bad for me, a, just a bad copy of what Noma was good at, or Cox was good at, or Lale was good at. I was very influenced by all of these stuff. I had some dishes on that was my own thing. Uh, there was some earthworms, of course, some, something disgusting. That's the, the, the thing I do. And then there was the, like the chicken feet and stuff like that. Mostly of the meal was was quite inspired by others. And, and for me, in the end of the day, it didn't make that much sense. Um, we have, when we take that money, money from our guests, we need to, we have the responsibility that, that the producers and the things that we serve is, is the best quality and of course focus on the sustainability and stuff like that. But that's just common sense for me. It, it needed to be more than that. So I actually just quit my job there um, without having any, anything to do. Um, but I, I just knew that I shouldn't do this for the rest of my life because I, I, I didn't feel there was more in it than just cooking good food. And, I look, um, and don't get me wrong, because I really love the fine dining aspect of, uh, of being a chef, like having this uh, every day, this trench chef working for the same food, very food groups, and going for the same ambitions and want to be one of the best. And all of these things is, is an amazing energy, and you can't get that anywhere, anywhere else, I don't think so. so. But it was just. It needed to make more sense at that point. So after a couple of months thinking about and getting a lot of uh, good uh, jobs, uh, yeah, offers, offers uh, from, from different restaurants around Denmark, um, I decided to open my own place or wanted to go to my own place. Um, because all of these offers were still the same thing. You come into the restaurant, you should create a tasting menu, start with some snacks, as a meal. There's a pet for us, and uh, it was the it was the it was the same thing. Of course, you could change that the meal and get it more personal and use ten years of that. But in the end of the day, it was the same restaurant. You couldn't go to uh, a hotel that's been on for twenty years and say like now you need to have curtains everywhere. We want to create this uh, dark wine and the spotlights and, uh, and all of these things. So I decided to go to the bank and. Uh, Asked if they wanted to borrow me any money. I said, I need two millions. I want to make a restaurant. It should be one of the best restaurants in the world. I don't need to earn anything. And I was like, yeah, you, you, this, this not going to happen. <laughs> and, um, and then I went to the, to the bank again with a budget. That's where I stood. I will make money. So it's sort of ridiculous. And they said, okay, now we make two millions. And the budget's, yeah. It, it, I, I made money, 30,000, but not that much. Um, and opened up in, uh, in 2015 in August. So um, I found a little location in, uh, in Österbo, in Augsburg. Uh, opened this uh, tiny restaurant where we wanted to put focus on something else. We wanted to do a restaurant that was something more than just who could speak about subjects that could uh, maybe put awareness in people's mind, uh, doing something beyond the plate. Uh, but we didn't have the word for what, what is, is this, uh, this kind of restaurant. So it ended up, uh, I had to, two months to build uh, the place uh, from uh, Bistro that was there before, Davis Bistro, a great Bistro, um, but into something completely else. The first counter, like 100% counter seating restaurant in Denmark. Um, I think we had one, uh, over 1,000 requests of an, uh, seats before we opened up. Nobody knew what we were doing. It was, I, the only thing I said was like, we open in Copenhagen, we call out this. There will be 15 seats and it will cost 18 months or something like that. And we have a lot signed up. So I was like, should I just do a three course meal and then earn a lot of good money in the first three months and then close down again? Um, but we didn't. Uh, the idea was to create a, a 45 
was not even the number, but it became the number, but, but uh, a long tasting menu where you could be outside this box of, uh, and, and be creative and, and not be forced to serve something that pleased uh, the most of the diners because you were because you only have a meal that is maybe 12 courses where two of them is proteins and then you need to serve something that is pleasing the, the most. Um, and very inspired by, uh, by the theatre and uh, the art scene without having any insight in those worlds whatever. Like uh, coming from a family culture background where a lot of chefs have a huge full history about mom, mom's cooking. So like my mom is a terrible chef, don't cook uh, because you can't cook at all. Um, <laughs> Every Friday we visit McDonald's and stuff like that. And didn't have been to a museum and a theater, uh, art exhibitions, not so ever. So, but I was very inspired by this, like the acts and spotlights. And that was like kind of the first thing I wanted to show in this was like, that was the spotlight on the thing. That was the important thing. It was the experience. It was the food. And uh, then the surroundings should definitely be more black and, and ambient and, and create this. Uh, I wanted to create a restaurant where you couldn't see any police car driving by. You couldn't feel any time of like what is the time you just were here for this thing and you need to to, to be about it like this. so um, two months to build it um, i was i was not that clear with that uh, at the time and i put an opening date before i even begin to build the 22nd of august and i sold it out because i needed the money to build the project as well um, and the, the good guy that bought all the seats uh, is a food in Copenhagen and, and invited, of course, all of the food critics and stuff like that on the first night. So thank you. Yeah, it's a for that. <laughs> um, and uh, so there was no like point of return. It was we, we needed to open at that point. Unfortunately, I got some blood clots and stuff like the classic story that uh, is like building a restaurant, painting the toilet. Uh, five minutes to six uh, and, and then I went out in the kitchen and my, my four chefs, I, I remember the day before I was just gone out from the hospital with one bucket up and, and I came into the kitchen and I was like, we should supposed to do this test dinner, um, but we were not ready for it, we had not all the visa class ready, so we, we needed, after two dishes I said to my chef, we don't do this, we do it tomorrow, then it was go completely failure or, or otherwise it become a success, so let's see. Um, and then after painting the toilet, literally five minutes to five to, to six, um, I went in out in the kitchen and I was just like, but what about all the plates? Because we have 45 servings and we have not used the plates to none of the dishes. That was, so it was, a, it was quite a, quite an opening night, uh, but, but fun and, and uh, <laughs> challenging and, and lucky me. The, I don't understand why and how, but the guest was happy, uh, and uh, I think it came good for, from the start. Just want to showcase the just little bit of facts about the, the restaurant. I was a head chef and the only owner of the restaurant. It was uh, 125 square meters, so pretty small. We did uh, around 45 servings, sometimes with 47, sometimes 40. It's not the number for me. That's 15 seats. Uh, we were in the end. We started with about four chefs. We ended up being chef, uh, six chefs and three waiters. Uh, there was one kitchen and one dining area. So um, it was quite uh, quite small. Uh, and uh, yeah, the food there was, uh, we wanted to play around with textures. And I'm really, uh, right now, really focused about the mouth feeling of the food and, and how the texture can, and can change your experience and also taste wise. Um, so we did like this frozen foam that was made of lemon hands from extra from lemon hands. We have made a 2.0 uh, version of this that's called Greed on the restaurant. Um, and, and this was just a refreshment, one of the first starters. Then we did uh, this, there was a lemon cocktail. I uh, did a little tomato cocktail on tree top. Um, so this was the 2.0 of that one. Um, always like feel like if you could suck out all of this great uh, lemon flavor from the lemon, it would be amazing. So this is our version of a Tom Collins cocktail. And then we have more like a parochial uh, dishes like this one. Um, that was also maybe the dish that, that made me feel like this can be something more than, than, than just cooking. And, and uh, there was this organ donation dish. So you get in a lamb, lamb heart, fill up with a lamb heart tar. That was like a transfusion back coming into the restaurant. Uh, to start with, it was just like a, a set up for a, for a camera. 
then I, we had a guest that was working as a doctor in the hospital, so he brought us a real one. Uh, he stole it, can't say it's either. Um, and then we put it out on the table, uh, on top of the tatar, and then we served. After the, two, the first bite, we came in with his folder to do sign up to be a walk and at the same time. So, a lot of people think it was a little bit disgustful. I thought it was beautiful, uh, especially when you thought about there was only 20% signed up for the walk and donut, but 80% of them are very positive about all these things they have the time to, to do. Um, and shouldn't we be automatically in my brand? And, and we didn't want to like choose from people what is the right thing to do, we just wanted to create a balance of that. So, yeah. so we ended up signing over 1,500 donors uh, up to the Hawk and Donut. Uh, we had 15 seats. A lot of them were from all over the countries from Denmark. So, so actually it was, it was quite a lot. Uh, but the funny thing about it was it became a, a dish that was also a lot in the media. Like all of the Danish newspaper, we had the, um, the 22 news in Denmark, there was big, big news in, in and, uh, and then the BBC Worldwide made a story about it. And when they came out, the BBC Worldwide, this is a, we are only five chefs, it's a 15 seat calendar responding to this small off scale in Copenhagen. If, if this can put that much awareness about if food can be this kind of culinary language, could it uh, that could be quite interesting to work on and uh, see how far could you go with food and use that as a speaking tool? Because you can think, wherever where you come from in the world, food is something you have in common. Um, so it was actually one of the issues where I was like, this is, uh, I said to them, I remember I came in with an article, an article to the chefs and said, this, we need to do more of this, maybe not 40, serving is like a, uh, a hard solution, I think. Uh, yeah. And then we did the wood lice uh, serving here, uh, which was, um, was found out that we have a biologic, uh, biology working with us, there is uh, trying different kind of insects and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, told me that uh, wood life was actually the family with, uh, with shrimps and um, it's just living on the ground and have the same proteins and if you're allergic to shrimps and shellfish you can't eat wood lice and he said like roast them on the pan with a little garlic and it would taste the same so I, I did that uh, uh, and, and for me that can taste like shrimp I don't have this fatty meaty like shrimp meat flavor but you have to like the shell kind of flavor so we made a tom yam soup out of it um, so we got two kilos of wood lice every week, it's quite a lot. <laughs> uh, we started collecting them ourselves in the park, but after like five years of running around, it's <laughs> like we can't do this anymore. People will kill us. So um, we made this, um, and, and we made actually the stoop to start with, because I think it's very important when you try to grow or try to do something, but it's, it's not for it's the sake of provoking. So, so we did actually the soup just as a regular soup where we made the kind of the noodles of, um, of the wood lice itself and then we told people this is made of wood lice or roly poly is what we call it in the US and, and they knew the names um, <coughs> but people didn't believe it it was like yeah that's good because you had an astro, you had a lot of all of these things and they would come to a point in the meal where like yeah fuck off you're just kidding and then I was like, nobody's believing in this, we put them on the plate. So, uh, so there was a line on the plate and found out if you had a, a, a stock abroad that was around 82 degrees, it actually became crispy and nice to, to drink as well. So, uh, so we served them alive in front of the guest, and it was probably one of the dishes that we sent most out in the time. But, but again, I think I, I think it's what it can in this setting, that you create an atmosphere where people, and if you have them with the taste and start of the meal, that you actually create an atmosphere where, where everything really is possible to get people to eat. And when you come from Manos, you are like, yeah, that's, that's cheap to make. So yeah, uh, lamb skull, uh, rotten lamb brain. I uh, wanted to put focus on uh, on using the whole parts of the animals and also look the animals in the eyes when you eat them. Because I think one of the, I don't think the future is not to eat any meat at all. I think we need to eat better quality of it, uh, lower the quantity, um, and then have to respect the animal to use the whole thing. And we do that in Asia, we do it in France, and, and there has been tradition to use it that way as well. But that's just something that's not been passed over to other generations. So um, you need to practice skull and backhand, and then you eat this rotten lamb brain inside. Of course, it needs to be rotten. It couldn't be a beautiful lamb brain. So it was me and worms and stuff like that. On top of that. Um, so after after that, two months after we opened the uh, um, 
my partner now, Nasaya, came into the restaurant and asked me, like, if you wanted more food on the fire, let me know. Uh, I was like, I just had blood clothes. We just did this restaurant. I designed it and built it myself by YouTube and Google, and now I'm coming two months after we opened and said, like, you want to give some money to it. I was like, it's not the most perfect time, but, but I was like, I didn't want to burn any bridges. Um, so we, um, we met up on Daniel Terre, and he said, like, showcase me your biggest dream, and I'll draw it for him. Uh, and then we, uh, then I was just drawing the thing I thought this would be possible to make. He would say no, like, straight away. And then they like, I want to be a part of that. Uh, so you went home with the drawings, looking at your little restaurant and like, look at the drawings and said, this can maybe be a, be a reality. And then we started the, the process of negotiating partnerships and all of these uh, boring things and took one and a half years to do that. So um, Alchemist 2.0, or I didn't want to call it that because everything is 2.0. I just wanted to call it, but everybody calls it 2.0. So that was pretty nice. But, um, but I was very inspired by, in the end of Alchemist, I became very inspired by art. Um, it was a little bit like to attending to the culinary school where it was a, it was a completely mind-blowing experience like because I've never had chicken any other way than overcooked uh, and, and all of these things. So it was uh, it was the same thing when I entered like and meet artists and went to Luciana and really got this experience. There's, because I've never been a chef that's been uh, had my inspiration coming with going walking through the sea or been in the forest and, and stuff like that. I can't really find inspiration, it's just a forest for me. Uh, uh, I've grown up in Atlantis, there's forest very well. Um, it's not that inspiration. But, 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 but some chef find inspiration there, that's, that's amazing. Uh, but I didn't, but I went, when I went to Luciana for the first time, I was like, this, there's so many things that I could copy, steal, like take from this universe and, and bring into the food. Uh, so I was very, very focused on that alchemies needed to have something that, like more art into it. Um, I think one of the things that I was very uh, keen on when I entered the partnership with Lars was to try to find out what is what is alchemist because we had uh, everybody put us in this box we had never seen and in 1800s, in the 60s I think was the first time since the US put uh, like a piece of meat in a potato dryer and, and in that way you use science to cooking tool and it's adapted everywhere in the world. If you go to drain your home or whatever, everybody uses one of the techniques to provide a better experience, I guess. So for me, it was an overused term, but I didn't have any term to correct journalists, the food critics, all of these people that wanted to put a mark on what is what is this, this cuisine. So for me, it was very important to define the cuisine. And, and I was like, we, we shouldn't make any manifest because I didn't want to like, repeat something, no. And it, wasn't, it was really important for me. It was not something just to do it. But, but, but for me, it was the lack of words for describing what was the thing we were doing and, and not put it in a, a box that was wrong. So we defined holistic cuisine, and as Dr. Fortissimari says, it's uh, looking at the whole instead of only parts. And, uh, and for me, that just made sense for all of the things we've done already in the old place. We had black toilet paper that was smelling of lavender, and nobody smelled to it. It was a bad investment, but it was black. Uh, that was focusing on the lights, that was uh, focusing on aromas in the restaurant, we sprayed different aromas and according to the meal and where you were. Um, and all of these things like this, this kind of makes sense for me to make a, a holistic prison. So um, I don't want to write up or like to say about what was done here. But at the end of the day, it's just using uh, elements from theater, art, science, and uh, technology. And then there's, of course, um, because a lot of people say, like, you don't love new body cuisine, and I do. I've been to the new normal 12 times already. And, and I love the diversity in, in cooking. And I love Japanese cuisine, I love Spanish cuisine, I love France cuisine. And uh, so it's not, uh, we don't want to neglect <laughs> that kind of cuisines at all. We just wanted to provide more layers on top of it. We just wanted to take elements from the fear from art from, uh, and, and keep pushing on, on technology uh, because that's a constantly changed and if we need to like our biggest problem right now in the world is sustainability and, and if we need we need to solve that part of it with technology um, so it was uh, to manifest uh, uh, what we were doing and actually only on focusing on, on the restaurant 
that we're building. Uh, but when we defined it, we, we also found out this could actually be a thing that was uh, hopefully we'll be taking up of other restaurants, mm -hmm. restaurants and chefs, and hopefully bring a new language into the culinary, culinary world. So, um, Alchemist, uh, the new Alchemist and one holistic cuisines. So, we decided to build uh, this restaurant. Uh, this is uh, actually one of the first sketch. Um, I didn't make this sketch, but I made one that's similar to it um, and showed to us. And it was the idea behind creating an experience where you, you had the experience as a, as a big part of, of the meal. The meal is important, it needs to be sustainable, good suppliers need to be the best ingredients and all of these things you need to cook the turbot correctly and, and, and if it's a hot dish you need to be warm and, and stuff like that. But, but, but that's just common sense at the end of the day for me. So, so, so if you could add more layers it would be, be quite amazing. So I'll just take you down in the, a little bit of facts about the restaurant but also then show you the rooms and the experience that the guests have. So too much about lunch. Too little about <laughs> um, so, but one of the things that was really surprised me because I thought it was not about art, but I, I hired a dramaturg, Lucky Me, uh, really changed the, the whole thing. Um, a dramaturg is the, 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 the girl, the man focusing on the theoretic about the theater and helping the structure during the piece and make sure it's, it's edible for everybody who's coming in to see the piece. Um, and uh, for the first time in my life, I actually enjoyed to get lessons. Uh, so I uh, went up having a drama lessons every week with uh, with Luisa Lard, who is our drama too. Um, and of course, I could just say to her that like you need to tell like tell me what to use of words and fancy things, and we put it on, and then we are the smartest one. But I really wanted to learn the whole thing and back to the basic. I, I'm not a drama too yet. At all. But but, uh, but all the way back to Greek philosophers, Aristotle, we just talked about to Basil back to, to Sarah Kane, um, all of these amazing people. They already defined words in the theater world that we actually use in, in the restaurant. And uh, I just I was when I saw all of these things and I saw the drama, the classic drama structure in Danish Berlinermuseum, it was um, it was quite surprising for me that why didn't we work with this in a restaurant? Why didn't we? talk about the point of return, where is the climax, what kind of catharsis do you want people to end up with when you leave the restaurant, and why don't you make the restaurant experience more systematic and try to actually actually put it down on a paper and, and make a handle for it. So what we're trying to do right now, and still ongoing, is to make our drum structure of the restaurant and, and hopefully trying to really talk about the, the drum structure of the meal. Uh, in, in, in a meal. So we start uh, the experience uh, with uh, in what they call Anslay. There's a presentation of the there's the final overturn climax and, and, and the, the face out of it and the catharsis. So um, yeah, that's me leaving the dome. Um, it's the only picture I want to show for the for the build, like for, uh, for the construction. Uh, but we wanted to. I'm very inspired by the planetarium, which is probably the only like cultural thing I had in my back. Uh, my childhood memory, I went to Copenhagen to the planetarium and it's so amazing to see all this universe and the endless stars and all these things. I was like, if one day I will win a lot or collect campus enough, uh, I, will, uh, I, will make a rest of it, I will make a planetarium. And then I didn't collect campus enough, I didn't win a lot but I met us. <laughs> uh, but, but the dome actually needed to be peeled down again uh, from scratch. Uh, this is the picture before because you can see all of this. Normally you build the planetarium, you build it actually with this, uh, I read a lot about the planetarium, all of the project is how it works. And you build it normally with the uh, two centimeters, like space between a little bit of air. But a planetarium is built the way that everybody's looking nearly the same way, like you see it here on the screen. Um, and in this case, we wanted to make a bar where people are sitting different, have different like, views on, on the dome. So this just created a lot of shadows. So unfortunately, we needed to peel the whole thing down again, and then we, we rebuild it. But uh, it's the best decision I made. Here. But, but in, at that point, it was a really terrible decision to make. And the construction world called me the day after, and were like yelling at me. I was like, and you will bring money on this. <laughs> but, uh, but it was quite a challenging work. Um, so the space is uh, 2,200 square meters. 
uh, four levels, uh, 50 impressions, uh, 40 seats, 30 chefs, 20 front of house. Uh, there's one drama truck, there's one animator, there's four actors, two food scientists, there's four kitchens and one food lab, and then there's a wine set of 10,000 bottles of wine, sensory rooms, uh, artists, and installations. Our uh, huge bronze dog here, two ton bronze dog from Maria Bobinke, the famous artist, who only made ceramics. I went to her and said, Can you make uh, me a door? I need to be in bronze. And she said, Yeah, for sure. And she had never made a door before, she had never made anything in bronze, so it's been a nightmare. It's beautiful, but it's been a bit of a crazy nightmare. So you walk into the to the to the first uh, part of your experience. It's actually an exhibition room where we can change it. So uh, it's an artist that right up from uh, Lady Ico in New York. We flew there in three weeks. He was uh, graffiti painting the whole space, um, and then you are in the middle of Central Park. We wanted to speak about there was a lot of in, when we built the place. There was a lot of, uh, of Pascal's Paladin. Some of you know. I'm a very good friend of mine. <laughs> uh, and then there's a lot about Tron, Brexit, all of these things, and a lot about immigration. And, uh, and when you're from Manus, like my parents is very afraid of uh, these guys from the outside. But we just need to remember that all of the, if you look 200 years ago back, if you close the borders in Denmark, how much will be here in the, in the food world, and, and art, and music, and culture wise, there's just so much coming from the outside. So, so that was what we wanted to speak up about here. So when you enter the room, there's an actor sitting in the room. You get an edible paper where, with some croaks from different American personalities, like musicians, presidents, whatever, about embracing cultures. And then there is the old warehouse of the Royal Theatre, so the cranes lift off the, the wall. And you will go through our wine cellar. So the idea was to create a wine cellar where you were very surprised when you walked in and, and turned around because it's, it's a beautiful wine cellar in any kind of restaurant. But when you turn around, this actually 15 meter high wine cellar made completely glass and so bottles of wine. And then you have to look into our our little test kitchen over here, of the research and development department. So you're sitting here in the lounge and getting snacks, cocktails from the kitchen. Um, and uh, <coughs> the kitchen, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I don't know if that was nice. But then you walk up the staircase, walking past the wine cellar in the glass and walk into uh, to the main dining room, the dome. So, uh, yeah, we talked about, you can see it's a man designing, and we talked about skirts and ladies walking past, and, and for me it didn't matter. For all of the female staff, it didn't matter. So, yeah, but uh, no, it's not good. So, that's fine. You walk into the, to the dome, um, have 40 seats, uh, sitting like the old space and the old counter, so you have still like, Rooms where you can, for me it was very important, it didn't get, became too big, you still have this personal touch and, and you still have the atmosphere of creating, uh, creating this uh, intimate of, uh, like experience. Um, we have uh, like islands here where we do like mise en place in front of the house and also chefs uh, creating the, some of the part, last parts of the dishes and also in front of the guests. Uh, the dome can change the whole environment with the uh, 10 projectors and the multimedia server that's combining these projectors so you can create an image uh, like a surrounding that could be anything and just is to create your mind as uh, it's a surrounding for that. Then you walk into our sensory room or our next installation room. There is um, this about LGBTQ community. Found out that 80% of the LGBTQ to the community, gay couples, uh, lesbian world, don't walk down the streets with uh, in, in hands because the, the, there's too many yelling and stuff like that. And still in 2019, it's quite a big problem. So we do this uh, installation with uh, 2,000 meters of LED wires. They're creating this LED wire rainbow room in the restaurant with mirrors on the ceiling and the floor. So you feel like there's only less universe. And then we have the music consortium. consortium Last spot, they is doing all our sound design to the sound design to the road restaurant. Also, did the sound design to this restaurant. They follow you the, the sound in, in the room, and then you will walk into uh, the kitchen, uh, and then you go up to our like third floor where you have to look over all the, the whole the whole restaurant, and you need to digest the meal you've been through. And it was one of the things really missed on the old place, or having a place where you could serve a little cocktail or coffee and you could just relax and and. Think about what you just experienced. 
So uh, one of the settings we do right now uh, is we call Plastic Fantastic. Um, it's, uh, DTU came out with a report last year that 30% of Danish cuts is traceable plastic inside. Um, so and, and herrings, so I think. Uh, so quite a big surprise because we use a lot of cut in the Nordic region. Uh, and I use cut the whole life, uh, all my life as a chef. Um, and uh, so, so, so it was quite a challenging and a shock for me to read that report uh, and then we decided to make a dish out of it. So we make an edible plastic on the top um, that is made of uh, the cut bouillon and kusu starch from Japan so you can withdraw like sheets of plastic out of it. And then you put it, you put it on top of, uh, of the cut jaw bone where the, not the, the cheek but, but the cut jaw bone where it feeds it on. The, the idea was like where is the plastic coming in? It's coming in this way. So we wanted to showcase that. And there's a beautiful piece of meat actually inside the bone. So we grill it with a little bit of bone marrow and then you need to withdraw like the meat and the plastic uh, from the bone itself. So we create, we put it on the top of a plate that's made of a uh, local artist on the west coast, the cocoa bar, so like making things with plastic. So we can collect all of the kind of garbage you can find on the beach and then he's uh, bring that into a place and showcase them on that. So we're just putting a balance about uh, how we treat our oceans and, and we should not put plastic in them. So uh, then we have like more technical thing if we skip that one, but it's the scallop one and then we work with the viscosities in the sauce and um, try to make a, a this one sauce is laying in the same but they have the two different viscosities so we can it splits up but it's not split. Um, and it's two different, there's a muscle burn broth, and then there's a yuzu, like a muslin, uh, when you cut it in, so the roe is fake, it's not real roe, and then you eat a bit of, there's an hour attempt of making a raw scallop. So then we have the food for thought, um, but the art, uh, art director to make this, uh, art operation, make this beautiful heads with actually real human eyebrows. Uh, coming from all of the chefs, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I asked if it was cheaper to get the process fucking expensive to me, uh, but it was not. Uh, but the food for thought here was uh, about eating a mind, so only sustainable for grass producer in the world. Uh, there's not full fitting excuse. It take one year to produce. It's very limited production. There's 700 kilos this year, so it's pretty expensive this year. Uh, over 2,000 kilos a kilo. Um, but but it's not full fitting that way. So we make a, come in like a whole head. Uh, take off the, the skull and then you eat the mind inside. There's a pan fried foie gras in layers with Madeira, and then there's a, a little of a, like a foie gras here on the top. So you also play around with the, with the temperatures in the map because the top of it is frozen and the, the pan fried one is, is hot. Um, so it's really super good. Event. Uh, um, I don't know if it's uh, wrong crust. I'm not against all kind of foods. We need to have the diversity in the debate when we debate things like this. Um, because uh, there's really bad producers, there's good producers, and there's a producer like this doing it doing different and trying to change the market. But uh, we just need also the, in the debate to have the diversity yeah, that we'll put, we really wanted to put focus about this dish. Then we have uh, the brain. Um, again, the story about I'm using the whole thing of the animal, like have the respect for the whole animal. Uh, and the brain is one of the things that we just throw out um, or the export into Asia um, and to just to find a farm that actually wants to take his time to cut the skulls, take the brain out is, is nearly impossible, it's impossible to find. Uh, so we take it out ourselves, we get the heads and there's a lot of quality control uh, health wise uh, with the brains so it's also a big job to do it but we just think it's quite important. So, so it's trans and uh, we cut it in front of the guest at the table. We put the, we, Heat it up in a, like a walnut oil, very slowly, and then in front of the guests we uh, cut in the, and put it on a meringue that's made of the leftovers from the brains. Then we have one of the dishes that's inspired by art, uh, inspired by one of my favorite artists, Andy Warhol. Uh, I didn't know anything about music, art when I went into the chef uh, world, but we heard Sunday morning from uh, the Global Underground Club. Every uh, every Sunday we did brunch in my own catering company where I was trained as a chef. So to make uh, this homage, uh, homage to uh, Chinese woman and where the underground was, yeah, it, it was a thing we wanted to do. So no one all the technical thing, but it's quite hard to make a banana uh, uh, shell. Uh, inside there's like green bananas, tonga beans, and Manila, and this is uh, we use the technology of 3D printing on this one as well. So uh, 
So it's also to adopt and embrace all of the different te techniques and technologies that's coming into our, our world. So uh, the taste lab is the last part I want to talk about in, in holistic uh, experience is uh, our like food lab. We have uh, three chefs right now, uh, and our head of R&D is working on um, together with me. We're developing new dishes and new uh, impressions to the to restaurant, uh, and then we we have a, a project called Taste Lab where we want to change uh, things. So things are very important that. All of this thing, 2,200 square meters, uh, all of these chefs, all of this front of house, if it doesn't make sense on a global like uh, to a broader audience that that 40 guests coming in, it doesn't make sense at all to build that kind of restaurant. So we need to change something, we need to talk about plastic in the ocean, we need to talk about sustainability, we need to talk about the coral reef, we need to, to make a change in the way we be cooking and, and presenting to the guests and talk about it. So uh, the taste lab is uh, this idea where we want to create uh, a better food culture. So we would like to do small programs for farmers coming in from uh, maybe slacking off the kitchen, uh, certified kitchen. We uh, want to do some developing of the products. Uh, and we have this farmer program. We doing a lot for kids. Uh, we want to help uh, providing kids education material, also help uh, the schools with new te uh, techniques when you are example seeing uh, the cuts of uh, a cow in the, in the school book as a chef, there's not an otter on it. Right? The cow has an otter, we used it actually 200 years ago. So, so all of these things we would like to be a part of and as an organization focusing on the broader than just the just alchemist. Uh, so the taste lab have nothing to do with our mission, like it have it's there, the facilities, the salaries, the machines, all of these things. But it's a project where it should be out to a, to a broader audience than just to get in, in Cyprus and can hopefully inspire the R&D and the R&D is inspired by the Tesla. Lab. So um, in the Tesla Lab we, we, we work a lot of things and one of the things that uh, why I'm trying to uh, try is to get the hotel and restaurant school to, to actually change the book of the ASA author on a, on a cow and it's a, it's a big thing to do uh, to change that. Um, and uh, of the other we made this uh, little cheese, um, actually, so we treated the, the other like a cheese. Um, it doesn't have this melting effect, but all of the milk enzymes, when, it, uh, when you submit that, and after that you would uh, like uh, cold caramelize it in a, in a chamber where they can't grow any bacteria. Um, you create this kind of cheese, uh, cheese feeling and, uh, and cheese, uh, cheese taste and aroma. That's quite interesting, I think. And it's pretty cheap to, to buy right now. So, um, yeah, so what the, and, and then we have, uh, yeah, what, what Taste Lab is about. We did this uh, event with uh, Kevin Lane Cooking about kids inviting in. We're going to do that on a regular basis to the restaurant to open it up for some broader audience. Um, and also because this is the future, this is the one we need to change. Uh, this is the one we need to put more knowledge into and, and pass the, all of this into the work to the third generation. Uh, we did a little workshop uh, on the market. Uh, the bakery that was here, also in, in the meanwhile, the main cooking where I hit it was a kind of bit as well, uh, doing a small hot dog. So, um, um, so all of this is actually a, it's a big ambition, but but list like white guide, Michelin, all of these things is quite important as well. Uh, we really want to achieve it. It's a personal goal, it's a goal, and it's a, a, a way to to keep pushing every day, also for the whole staff. But the most important thing for me is actually trying to, in 15, 20, 30 years, whatever, when we look back at Alchemist, um, I, didn't, I don't want to become the restaurant that just got enough good prices and good reviews. I would like to look back at a restaurant that maybe changed a little thing in people and guests' minds, uh, and maybe added a little new letter to the culinary language. So, in the end of the day, it's trying to make a, a difference. So, that's uh, what I've just said.